Welcome back to Beyond the Curve. I'm Eric, your host. This is the audiophile video series where we answer questions from you, the audiophile community, joined again by our special guests, Yermo and Werner. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to talk about research and development and manufacturing, and we've got a lot to talk about. So let's dive right in. And of course, a big thank you to our community for submitting these questions. We're going to jump right in with a question from the community about audiophile headphones. And feel free to take this one. Uh, what is the difference between an audiophile headphone and an everyday headphone? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think it sort of touches the heart of uh, what makes Sennheiser different. Because in the end, uh, the audiophile headphone is really focused on no compromise, best sound. So there's not as much of a notion for convenience, for instance. Of course, it should be still super comfortable, so you can listen for a long time. But nonetheless, um, you are happy to be confined to your home, for instance, um, or that you have wired, uh, wires attached to your in-ear. Um, but then comes basically the interesting step, because um, we obviously do not only offer Audify headphones, but also wireless headphones. And um, a lot of other companies, they basically look at the whole package and they say, OK, now we optimize the entire system for what the users recognize the most. So for instance, outstanding ANC performance. And um, that, for instance, requires a lot of um, excursion in the driver, just as an example. And um, then the, um, that might affect actually some factors that negatively affect the sound purity of music playback. So that you have a little bit more tumbling, some distortion in the midst or something. And for most companies, that is an absolutely perfect um, compromise because um, they say, OK, perfect ANC is what the customers care about the most. So that's what we are prior, uh, prioritizing. And for us, we come from this heritage of perfect sound reprodu reproduction, if you will. And so um, we still use basically the same transducers that we use for our high performance Audify headphones, also in something like the uh, Sennheiser uh, Momentum to Wireless series. And they are really, really optimized to so just have incredibly pure sound. And I personally think that is something that you can really evidently hear. So it's not just about the curve or something, but it just sounds much purer. It has a much better high frequency extension than what you sometimes find with the competition. Thank you for that insight. Uh, when it comes to developing headphones, whether it's an audiophile or um, an everyday headphone or an everyday workhorse, what, is, what does that look like in terms of research and development? We, we think of R&D as uh, scientists in a lab with beakers and burners and all sorts of tools and measurements. Is that, does that relate to your world? Um, I, I guess I, I take the first step and uh, go, go first a little bit into research and then Werner can go a little bit into development because he's actually developing all the time. Um, but. But yeah, R&D stands for research and development, and oftentimes it's just used as a whole term that covers every topic, basically, that creates uh, first the uh, te technologies that are used for a product and then brings those technologies to market in a product development. And for the research, it is very important to keep in mind that it is, a, that is an incredibly long lead time, especially if you want to do it well. So the best example of that is, uh, um, I, I'll just take the A900 um, again. So the, the small transducer in there, has effectively been in the making for 10 years. Um, so, so the 7 millimeter transducer has originally been started the development in 2007. And uh, there they thought about the, really the ideal compromise between a very small transducer that is ergonomically very good and that has an incredible high frequency response that is still manufacturable. And on the other hand, you, you have a very punchy bass response. So the smaller it gets, the harder it gets to build and the more it will distort during high excursion and bass. And so we try the, to find the best compromise where, where it is good to manufacture um, and it still has very good bass and a lot of headroom, which you can hear in my opinion. And um, then on the other hand, has really, really crisp high frequencies where small size is very be beneficial. So that was thought of back then in 2007 and it came first to market in the IE800 in 2012, really with a hand assembled transducer. So that was not really fit for mass production. And then the subsequent five years, they worked on uh, really serializing that production. And they built a, a really sophisticated transducer manufacturing line here up in Germany, um, where the transducer was then really made for mass production so that it could then land, for example, in our two wireless offerings. 
And um, over the past year, that line has been transferred to Ireland also to our uh, really own audio file uh, manufacturing facility. And um, that is something to keep in mind that we do not do innovation just from today to, to tomorrow, but you have to lay the foundation really now for things you will do in five or 10 years. And one thing is just proof of concepting something and showing that a certain concept works, then maybe doing small series production for very exclusive products. And only after that point, you can sort of go into it when you are really convinced that it works and that there's a market for it. Then you go into it and say, okay, now we are going to serialize it and really put tens of millions into making this technology really uh, ripe for two wireless devices, for instance. And that is what happened here and which is really outstanding and which probably happens at no other company that is really focused mostly on pure sound quality. And after that, now that the transducer is finished, the product developer comes in. <laughs> so here's to you, Werner. <laughs> so um, in the last episode, uh, we were asked about DIYing. And uh, <laughs> I would say, like, uh, if we have a, a finished transducer, um, then, I mean, uh, the tools I can use if I want to DIY an, an earphone is, uh, we have on the, one, uh, on the one hand, we have simulation models, be it lumped element or finite uh, element uh, simulations. And we can uh, modify them just to, to to tune our earphones to a different uh, frequency response before actually building models. Um, so this is one part, uh, the theoretical part. And the other part is just, uh, yes, um, grab a computer-aided design uh, program, modify um, some mechanical parts, and then send them to the 3D printer, print it out. Um, glue in and solder in uh, the, the transducer uh, we got handed over and then make some tests, um, some measurements um, and compare um, the measurement data of what we uh, have expected or what, what we are expecting from the simulations. So it's a, a lot of um, simulating, then prototyping, listening, talking with others, with colleagues and then going back. And yeah, we, we do those loops a couple of times and uh, at some point we're satisfied and then it might get a product. Actually, it's, it's really, really hard to get satisfied. So usually <laughs> you have at least three people in the room that aren't satisfied, but nonetheless, then there's uh, someone really evil and it's usually the product manager that says, okay, now we have to go with this because you can't go on eternally. So the enemy of, uh, of, of better is best. So. So even, even if you have something that is already much better than everything else on the market, if you even then try to improve, then usually the project sort of goes off the rails. Um, so that's always uh, an interesting tension point between uh, wanting to make something perfect and saying, okay, we are good enough now. Um, and, and we are really confidently the best at what we want to do. There's a, a balancing act there. It's like an informed experimentation and you want it to be perfect, uh, but of course there's there's business factors and then there's the product itself uh, that all affect the timeline. And that's a great time to bring up a question. We actually had a question related to this uh, from YouTube and it was, is there a timeline for for your products? And, and relating to that, those platforms, those important platforms, uh, what headphones would you say are the most valuable to your company's history? So two-part question there. Let's start with uh, what does the timeline look like? Well, well, if you look at development length, if that is the timeline uh, you think about, then um, it, it varies a lot. So whether how many of the existing parts we are using, how many new ones we are, we are building, and with everything you build from, from the ground up, the more risk you introduce into the project, and then usually it, it goes longer and longer. Uh, a very good positive example of very fast projects is actually, let's see, this is actually the, ah, here it is, just one moment, the HG560S. So that is my first um, audiophile headphone baby, if you will, and it's very close to my heart because I, I did the acoustic engineering part myself in my basement. Um, so, so the history behind it is sort of that I knew that we were the, the standard for nuclear sound reproduction at these 400 euro price points. and. I thought to myself, okay, um, actually we are really, really good at mass production of really high quality products. 
that are still affordable. So that means that our mass-produced automated, automated transducers are, in terms of material cost, fairly cheap. The initial invest is, of course, huge. And on the other hand, we are pretty good at uh, really industrial design that is very efficient. And so I thought it would be natural that we would also be champions in terms of nuclear sound that is actually affordable <laughs> and, and not at least at the cost of an HG600. And so I started uh, also relating to all the DIY questions, just at home exchanging transducers and damping materials and so on. Until I had something I showed around at the company, most people liked it and I actually um, got the resources to, to do a small project. And that was, uh, I think, one of the fastest projects ever at this company. So we kicked it off, I think, in uh, in... I think late March 2020, and we had our first uh, pre-mass production in June, and uh, we mass produced in August, and then the product went live, I think, in October. And, and so this is pretty much the fastest you can go uh, if you, everything <laughs> goes well. <laughs> and, and even though we built a new transducer for it, so that was also only possible because different functions uh, really did their best, even though the transducer guys really like to have a bit of lead time. They all really helped out and uh, in record time actually built a new variant that was just uh, of extraordinary performance and really lifted up the project uh, product. Um, so this is um, as, as fast as you can go. And I, I think for normal products, it would be more like two years. Um, so that is just an average, uh, yeah, uh, average rule of thumb. And then um, what you have to think about is that we cannot do uh, basically everything at once <laughs> that is for for me personally the biggest <laughs> the biggest challenge that i would like to do like five things um right now but i have one team <laughs> and <laughs> and one team can build uh, like one product in two years um or if it's a variant then maybe it's two products uh but 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 nonetheless it's uh um it's a huge constraint and there's always a lot of different factors on what is now the most important thing um and one thing can be just um, we all want, for instance, the next tie and headphone or something. That is something that I personally want a lot. <laughs> you can trust me. Um, um, and other things are really the manufacturing, for instance, of existing products that that is unfortunately not as ideal as we would like it to be. Um, we have other things like that we want to enter specific categories. So here we wanted to have a very high quality neutral headphone. We wanted to enter that category. So that was a priority from that respect. So there's a lot of different perspectives that you have to take. And then as a product manager, take the best decision for the business. Um, yeah, so that is sort of the story of my life. Um, I, I think for the, for, the, for the historical part, I think I can hand over to Werner first because um, he's a little bit uh, newer to the business. He's still a few years here, but, <laughs> but most people seem to be for 10 or 20 years here. <laughs> So he maybe has a bit of an unbiased opinion on what is the most important Sennheiser products. <laughs> and and, and Werner, maybe you can maybe you can speak to this because and and both of you have now experienced this. You knew of the company and the products before working for the company, right? So your experience, Werner, as uh, working in the uh, live sound industry, um, you've been exposed to these things. Tell us now, having seen both sides of 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 the walls here. What does that look like? What, what, what are some of these important products to you that become the foundation of what you do on a daily basis? Yeah, so um, actually I, I bought many, many Sennheiser and, uh, and also Neumann products uh, before joining the company and uh, I paid the full price. Uh, now I can buy the <laughs> discounted, <laughs> but, I, but I almost have the whole range uh, because I bought it before I joined. Um, Yes, I would say very, very important, um, as we discussed already in the last episode, is definitely um, HD 600 and 650 because they're now, I would say, the, the gold standard in, in neutral uh, sound sound tuning. Um, but uh, I would like to, to go some years back, some decades. Um, I think a very, very important milestone for Sennheiser was definitely the HD 414. This was the first open back headphone ever. And when was it released? In the late 60s, maybe? Yeah, yeah 68, I think. Oh, 68. Yes, they sold uh, hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of it. And um, I, st I still um, I have one uh, on my desk but I bought it used online. <laughs> uh, we, we don't manufacture it anymore, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, I would say this is definitely a very important headphone. And for the audiophile part, um, 
of of course it's the HD 800. It's uh, incredibly iconic design. I would say this is to me this is the the most remarkable um, design of any headphone I know. Uh, I really love it. And um, yes, I would say that's it for the over ear um, um, headband products, headband um, headphones. And Yemo, what what do you think uh, about the in ear uh, headphones? Yeah. Uh, so first, I would like to echo that the H eight hundred is sort of the thing that I'm probably most proud of in terms of product at the, of this company. So it it has really created this this market for super end headphones, and I think it still beats way above, above its price. So it's still the most open headphone in the world, and and that um, has such a huge impact on on the space. You hear the details and so on. So this is really the proving point that there's there's more to this company, if you will, than than, uh, than just building transducer or something, but really intimate knowledge of the entire system. Um, yeah, in, in terms of in ears, I, I mean, we just brought out um, li like a lineup of, of four in ears, um, and I think they are all just a huge step above everything else. What's super interesting, what I wouldn't have thought, for instance, the IATS, which is sort of here a niche product in, in the rest, or which used to be a niche product. It was actually for some po time the the commercially most important product for audiophile, um, which you only know if if you're behind the curtains. So that was sort of uh, that gave us actually a lot of resources to to try out in in development and and so on. And uh, nonetheless, it is a very old product concept. It's I think from 25 or something originally the IE8, and um, I, I think it's really cool to see where we went from that product concept where Sennheiser originally wasn't very strong to something like the i900 or i200 at the both extremes that we have right now. So the i900 just, I think it really sounds one step above everything else. It's incredibly detailed and uh, yeah, I really love how it came out. And the i200 on the converse, it's uh, it's incredibly uh, comfortable. It has a very neutral sound and really uses the best technology on, in the world for a very affordable product. So I, I think it's sort of, it is, it represents really the core strength of the of this company that it uses really industry leading technology um, in something that anybody can afford, and that is something for me a very empowering mission um, that that you want people to enjoy the music truly, and and that this doesn't have to cost your liver or something. It's a lot clearer to me now. The research lends way to the development, and those become these evergreen platforms for future innovation and, and uh, dates all the way back to the original 414 and, and trickles down yeah. into some of the products we love and use every single day. So speaking of the in-ear series, right? Uh, we have a question again from YouTube. They're very thirsty for the R&D process. Uh, the question was uh, Sennheiser IEMs or in-ear monitors have improved a lot over the past two years, yet I don't think it's controversial to say that none of the IE series has captured the HD 600 and 650's amazing true to life accuracy or the eight, uh, HD 800's incredibly open and spacious experience. Does Sennheiser have plans for uh, targeting goals like this to essentially produce a headphone like sound in an earphone? Uh, now that Sennheiser uses the B and K 5128 which in theory makes headphones and IEM measurements much more comparable. I think we'll have to give a little background on what the B and K uh, 5128 is. Yermo or Werner, do you want to take that one? I, I can just go ahead and give a brief overview that there's a bunch of different measurement couplers from different companies. Uh, and um, the B and K 5128 is sort of the latest and best measurement coupler available on the market. And the remarkable thing is that uh, the most older measurement couplers are essentially just a steel tube with some openings inside to somehow resemble roughly the impedance of a human ear, but look nothing like it. But that was an industry standard for something like 40 or 50 years. And uh, the, the 5128 is a first measurement coupler that really scientifically grounded uses basically an anatomically correct ear, which um, should then really reflect um, very, very true to life uh, measurements of how it would look like in a very average ear, which, <laughs> which, which is a very funny concept in the end because it's, uh, it's just a measurement of an average ear, so not necessarily yours, but still it's sort of the Porsche of it. It costs like 50,000 euros. So 
Um, it, and it's a really cool device. So of course we we love using it, and it always enlightens, of course, our way of working. Um, yeah, but I find the question very, very amusing, actually, because it sort of implies that if you just tune an in-ear to the same shape of an HG600 or HG800 on a more sophisticated measurement rig, then that you would get a similarly outstanding product. Um, so that is, again, reducing it a little bit, the frequency response or the entire performance of the headphone back to only the frequency response uh, and only the like technical frequency response, so not the one that you perceive actually psychoacoustically, but something that you measure on an average measurement head that doesn't have any psychoacoustics in there. So that is a, um, that takes out a bunch of factors that are extremely important. And um, to me personally, or at least I think a lot of Sennheiser engineers think so, is that openness in a headphone and a large transducer and so on, they, they are very important facilitating factors for achieving neutrality. And a very good example of that is actually going beyond headphones to a loudspeaker, that you get a perfectly natural treble response um, with a loudspeaker uh, in, a, in a treated room, because everything, your entire body, your entire body shape, your pinna, everything that has reflections and affects the sound that you hear is perfectly taken care of. And the moment you take a headphone and you somehow couple a transducer next to your ear, suddenly you um, have resonances in there that shouldn't be there and, and suddenly the treble is a little bit uneven. And some headphones do it better than others, but none do it as well as a loudspeaker, unfortunately. But um, you can get very, very close with an HD800, for instance. That is so, sort of the most open and very angled and very large transducers and so on. So, so it can make it as natural as possible. And in my opinion, this, this is just a natural um, let's say confinement of in-ears, that there is just so much personal variation with it, with the ear coupling, that you very quickly hit a limit of, okay, this will be liked by everyone, because um, it just sounds so different for everybody. And then you have to make so many assumptions about, okay, what would be the impact of the pinner for this person? What would be the impact of the um, of any resonances you in, have in there? And you can try to counteract them with resonator chambers and so on, but you cannot never really make it perfect. So um, that, that would be my answer to it. I, I think it is, um, at least with a passive product, so that doesn't have any active electronics uh, to make it like uh, a neutral standard like we have with the HG600. Thank you, uh, terrific. It sounds like we have two different species that will forever be a bit separated. Uh, from being a user myself uh, over the past uh, 20 years, I've noticed that we've gotten so much closer to that uh, true headphone sound. Um, and uh, that experience has become much more natural. Werner, in, in your experience with the, um, with the in-ear series, especially because of your background in live sound, have you, have you seen um, a change in, in our approach to tuning them uh, over, over, since you've been here and, and especially versus products you've already used? Um. Well, I would say it's it's just about not changing something, but just improving uh, our products. And of course, you you always can improve something. You know, there are advances in in research and development, and uh, we're we're not not at the end. So people, uh, our products will get will get better. And um, yeah, so we're not not completely changing what we're doing, but just we identify um, we identify some some parts of the product where we can be even better. We, we can even uh, have less distortion, even better high frequency reproduction and so on. And um, yeah, that's that's what we do. I'd like to, to share, um, because we had a very specific uh, question about the, the high frequency uh, head and torso simulator by Brulin Care. I'd just like to share um, an insight. Um, of course, we have this coupler and uh, um, like uh, I would say in the earlier days there were couplers for example the IEC 711 uh, standard and those are couplers which don't have uh, an anthropometric ear so this is just a steel part um, where you insert the earphone um, but the more advanced couplers um, they have um, like artificial ears but which are made of silicone and very very close uh, to real ears um, but in the development process, uh, both of those coupler types have their place. Because if you, 
if you um, want to, if you make a change, for example, you change a, a resonator in a in a very very specific way, and to, you want to 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 see if the change actually uh, is is changing the, the the frequency response as you want to, working with those couplers which are completely made of steel, uh, is very helpful because. Uh, inserting the earphone exactly the same way every time every time is very easy but then if you want to check um, how does it compare to to um, to the sound that like real humans perceive those more advanced couplers with uh, artificial ears which are very similar to to human ears are um, the way to go I would say so it's not that we use the, the newest couplers with anthropometric uh, pinners for everything. So both coupler types have their place in the development process. Great opportunity to pull in another question. And I'm going to read the question and, and back into it. Uh, we did have another question from YouTube. Uh, what are your thoughts on growing opinions in the headphone hobby about the importance of frequency response and measurements? I think what we're getting at here is, are you taking that into consideration when developing a product? Are you setting out to create something that measures well, or are you starting solely with the human experience? Uh, it's a really cool question, and it's something that has crossed my mind a lot of times over the past years. Um, so, so, of course, we, we care about what these people say that, that measure themselves and influence the opinion of the community. But on the converse side, we not only hear the community opinion, but we also see the actual commercial success of our products. And one thing that is a very good example of that is that um, for the past years, for instance, the original HG660S was more successful than either the HG600 or 650, despite costing more. So um, that is something to think about, even though the community would probably have a very strong opinion on, on which one is better and more sophisticated. Um, that, that the people buying the products may have a different mind. And um, of, of course, to us, commercial uh, success is important <laughs> to a certain degree. And, and so um, in the end, of course, we take it into consideration. But I really try to take the approach of, OK, if this is really the, the last product I can develop at this company, what would I like it to be? Would I like it to be a headphone that, that measures well but doesn't sound very good? Or would it be a headphone that I just enjoy using and recommending to my friends and family? And um, for me, that choice is just crystal clear now. So, so I would always go for the bad measurement, if it is so. Because, of course, oftentimes it also coincides that it happens to measure well, but it also sounds spectacular. <laughs> but but <laughs> the, the, the sounding good to an actual human, that is the most important part. One of the most human sounding headphones ever created was uh, the Orpheus and the HE1. I think yeah. that connected people to their music on a very emotional level. Uh, have we ever considered, or have you considered from your chair, um, creating an in-ear version of that or that experience in the form of an earphone? Yeah, I, I... And come back to the question we already had that the Orpheus, that it really has this incredibly huge transducer um, which, which really, um, it not only kind of puts a little bit of sound into your ear, but it actually moves the air around your head. I, I think you can actually feel that if you listen a little bit loudly. <laughs> and um, actually, actually um, Axel once told me in a conversation that, that uh, when, when he listens to organ music uh, with an HE1, that he can sometimes feel the vibration in his legs. Uh, and that, that doesn't make any sense because it's a headphone. But the important <laughs> part of it is again that that it's a psychoacoustic experience and if the headphone is somehow good enough to give you a, a, a great illusion of that you're actually sitting in a church then your brain will fill in the rest and um, again a huge transducer that has a very low distortion a, a, a superior impulse response and so on that will just go such a long way of of creating that illusion and um, again with in-ears we are much more constrained just in terms of okay how much of your how much of how natural can we actually get and maybe with digital circuitry we can somehow get there in the future who knows but i think in terms of passive headphones uh, the, the i900 is very close to the ideal that we can get that was a question from the community and it ties into this next one um, how does the crossfeed feature which is something you can find on the he1 
Uh, how does that affect the listening experience? Usually uh, the bass gets a bit louder, but is that necessarily more accurate? It's, it's a question of philo philosophy, but uh, Werner, I think you were thinking of something. <laughs> well, um, I wouldn't say that, or to my experience, the bass doesn't get louder um, using the CrossFit feature. Um, I, I did um, some uh, listening tests on, on the CrossFit feature. It, it was developed before I joined the company, so I had a very close look at uh, how it is realized in the AG1. And uh, I would say it strongly depends on the type of music. If the, the music is more mono, like if you listen to modern modern uh, pop music, um, often the, the, the mix is, is pretty mono, I would say, because it's maybe optimized to be played on, on a, a mono device, just like a small radio or on your phone. So then the CrossFit doesn't make um, that, that much of a difference. But um, if you listen um, to music with a very wide stereo image, um, for example, a guitar panned to the to hard left or hard right, um, or an orchestral recording with a very, very broad uh, stereo image of an orchestra, for example, then I think having the CrossFit feature uh, can be very beneficial just because the isolation of a sound source on, on one side uh, is, is, is gone or removed by this CrossFit feature. Yeah, and, and just to take a step back, so I really, really like that answer um, and I re remember that listening test that we did. Um, is that crossfeed just functionally so that everybody who's listening in here, um, it, it feeds from, from the uh, from one channel uh, a part of the signal into the other channel and tries to simulate a more natural, uh, let's say, experience of sound because in a normal case you would of course hear with both ears uh, a part of the left loudspeaker and with both ears a part of the right loudspeaker and you try to emulate that to a certain degree with some technical limitations of course. So. But, but what we found there in the listening test is really that it depends so, so strongly in the music. It's uh, on song A, it's good. On song B, it's bad. And um, yeah. Um, that's why you can turn it and on. That's why off. there's a switch. <laughs> you can turn it on or off. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's really about experimentation and seeing what you like. And that is uh, honestly the, the biggest theme, in, I think, in terms of this hobby of the audiophile journey, that, that you really just have to experiment for yourself. And of course, other people have, have opinions. But, but in the end, it, it matters to what sounds good to you. That's, uh, that's the most important. So keep that piece in mind. <laughs> we, we've got time for one more. And I want to, um, we'll show this question on the screen. And it does need a little bit of uh, interpretation here. Um, and this relates to the manufacturing side uh, of the business uh, regarding an HD 800S. Uh, when it's manufactured, are there, is there a course correction with regards to tuning, there's been discussion on the internet of, um, hey, mine, mine sounds a little bit different. Uh, does tuning evolve during production, uh, even in the middle of it, uh, or is that uh, is it all a myth? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question, and that's a huge rabbit hole. So um, we have right now the opportunity to make another thirty-minute episode, but I try to <laughs> keep it uh, like to ten percent of the time. But the short answer is that. Over time, um, so first that there's no one HD800 tuning, but that we try to find a corridor in which we think it sounds very, very good. And I give you quickly the example of, of why it's very hard to build an HD800 very accurately. And I'll take one particular part here, and that is this one. Um, this is uh, the Bafel or the Schallwand, as we say in German, of the HD800. And as you see, it is uh, made out of a stainless steel mesh. So this fabric, if you will, uh, determines how much air escapes the ear cup um, during music playback. So if it's very, very dense, then a lot of air will be kept in and you have a tighter bass response, but it won't be as open, of course. <laughs> and on the other hand, if you open it up too much, you lose a lot of bass response. So you need to find the perfect middle ground. And also um, it ought to be the, the ideal, um, let's say, natural um, perception of, of openness. So uh, there, there's always, uh, let, let's say, an interaction of, of, the, of the sound within, either reflecting from, from the baffle or, or being absorbed by the material or just going through it, so absorbing. And, and you might need to find the perfect 
a combination of all these uh, properties to, to in the end have a very natural sounding headphone. Anyhow, so um, we, we need to source this raw material, this, uh, the stainless steel mesh um, at a manufacturer that normally does filtration for motors, for instance. And um, that, um, they have to meet a very, very exact specification of so and so many Sennheiser ohms, which is our internal development measurement for, for, um, for uh, acoustic impedance of materials. And um, so he takes his steel mesh and then he waltzes it down a few times until he, um, and the thinner it gets, the more air can basically pass it. And he waltzes it once and measures it and waltzes it twice and measures it and so on until we have something that is in our tolerance limits. And the next step is that we, uh, we supply it to a, um, to a plastic injection specialist that injects it, uh, injects it into the chassis that we actually have. And um, that is a very, very heat and, and, and pressure intense process. And that again changes a lot the actual um, properties of this product so that it can end up again with a lot of uh, um, acoustic impedance or very little acoustic impedance. So again, we do not have like always perfectly 200 Sennheiser ohms, for instance, but we have a whole range between maybe 150 and 300. And um, that also over time changed. I mean, the platform is in production now for nearly 15 years. And um, what, what we do then is we classify them in, in actually, I think, eight different classes of, of different baffles of different uh, of different impedances, and then we build transducers specifically for these baffle classes, so that that you have maybe uh, an H800 with a baffle class A and uh, and transducer five or something, um, and all these combinations obviously are not perfectly the same, but they will have subtly different impressions of sound, and um, the the gist of it is that this process was developed over the years, so it was fairly simple at the beginning. And over time, as we really became more and more concerned with quality, we, we became much more sophisticated with it. And that is its source probably of what people see in, in the difference over time in terms of tuning. But the big pitfall of that is that you usually have one headphone maybe from 2009 or maybe three, and then you have three from 2014, and then you have three H800S from 2017, and then you have maybe three if you're very good already as a consumer <laughs> to, to get to get 20 H800s. Um, but actually in terms of production variants, that is a low number. So it doesn't even cover the amount of variances that we have ordinarily in, in production. So normally you would need to measure like 50 or 100 of a single production run <laughs> to get a good grasp of the, of the variation in it. So the answer is, yes, there has been some development over time. Um, the effort was always made to, to keep our quality higher than before. And uh, we have really developed a very, very sophisticated system so that every H800 sounds uh, really to the very highest quality. And the big challenge in the end is we do not do it for just one side, but we have two different sides, left and right. And the most important part is it has to match perfectly together. So doing it for one component is complex enough, but doing it for two to <laughs> is but be perfectly compatible to, to each other. That is the huge challenge that we have. And that is what makes the H800 so amazing. So um, that, that really any difference in, in the channel response will really s somehow make your, your sound image a little bit obscure, for instance. And it's suddenly not uh, natural anymore. And I think that is one of the biggest factors also of the H800, why it's still legendary in terms of that reproduction of space that it's just a perfectly accurate uh, yeah, sound image that you have. And that's also why it's uh, yeah, probably my, my go-to headphone in terms of really best, best sound performance ever. So to our viewers, when you pick up your HD800 or HD800S or HD600, just any model you have, look at those components. They're all purpose built and purpose matched for a specific sound. There's so much that goes into delivering that idea that may be started on a blank piece of paper or in Yermo's basement uh, or in on a flight uh, that uh, Werner took uh, trying to tune a headphone. A lot goes into bringing that idea to the next phase and into your doorstep and onto your head ultimately so you can connect with the music that matters to you most. Uh, so insightful, guys. Thank you so much for 
uh, offering that insight and a little uh, peek under the hood of what goes on uh, in terms of developing a product and then actually making it. There's so many challenges to overcome uh, to deliver that perfect sound. Um, that's a wrap for this episode of Beyond the Curve. Thank you so much to the community for uh, submitting these great questions. And we're looking forward to going beyond the curve with you again in another episode coming soon. Thanks. We'll see you in the next one.